So um, this afternoon, uh, Herb and I want to talk a bit about um, the issue, the question is, can this person handle a general management role? <clears throat> and what we're talking about is general management in a very specific sense. That is the ability to do work at, at stratum four, the capability to do work at stratum four. And, and um, the, uh, the reason for our interest in this particular is that this comes up in a lot of key consulting places. And I think from what Joshua was saying this morning, you can see the issues that he's dealing with structurally with these small and growing companies pivot around that. He said that many of these CEOs he sees are in transition between four and five in order to take the thing from a, from a product to a company. And um, that so what they are is stratum for people who are in, in transition and that they're not careful. They won't staff beneath them properly. They won't staff with stratum 4K general management capability either in their line organizations or their functional organizations. And they'll, they won't be able to do this turn he's talking about. <clears throat> and so the, the ability to judge which of his people in middle management can in fact handle these stratum 4 roles or general management <coughs> roles is really key. And of course, this is what Herb and I and Joshua and some others often do for a living for companies in the sense we help them assess their, their uh, uh, existing people for both talent management purposes but off, often for succession purposes as in the case we're talking about here. And then there's the case of, well, since we're moving people up out of stratum 3 into stratum 4, you know, are these people, how, when are those transitions going to occur? And are we operating in a way that will help them <coughs> get the skilled knowledge and experience that they need to make these transitions? So it's, it's um, there's a lot of things about the stratum for pivot point in these organizations that I think is really key. And um, what I'm hoping we'll end up doing here is putting forth enough information that in many cases uh, managers at four and five will able to be, make these judgments themselves better than they can now or else understand what they need to do in the sense of why it's important to have people at stratum four and what stratum four capability means and may reach out to consulting expertise in order to uh, make these judgments more precise. But until they really understand what they're looking for, they're often kind of the blind leading the blind and they, they can easily make the mistake of going with the person that run them. You, know, when they, you see this in growing organizations often in, in the accounting finance function. They have a, a bookkeeper that they think they can make into a controller. Well, that's a mistake usually going from two to three. The person is capable that two can't do controllership with three. Or when, when they get into a, a stratum five business where you need finance operating at stratum four in terms of being able to do all kinds of things aside from accounting, integrate all kinds of aspects of finance, including controllership and accounting and auditing and banking and financial planning and whatever else might be in the case of the, of the company. So this is really important to, to acknowledge. And I, what Herb and I are going to explore um, some, some things to look for and listen for that we've learned in our work, in our consulting work in, in, a, in assessing <coughs> candidates. And so let me let me hand this. We're going to do a little Huntley Brinkley, and I, there may be the odd one of you who are old enough to remember. <laughs> 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 or, but um, <clears throat> over to you. All right. And, and so a lot of what, what I'll be doing is describing aspects of Stratum Four work, and Don is going to be be illustrating what that sounds like in an interview. 
someone de demonstrating that they can do that. Um, I'm going to, I want to make a few more comments of, about, about Stratton Ford. Um, Don's been talking about this from a general management point of view. I've got a colleague who, uh, I've known him for, I guess, eight years, and I kept asking him, so Jim, what is it you do for a living? And finally, um, about six months ago, he told me, because he's always working on these projects, typically not-for-profit, maybe governmental, um, some other kind of organization. He's, he's one of these uh, idealists. He, he won't get out of bed unless the, the project has something to do with improving society. He doesn't care how it improves it. Um, and what he has found is an enormous amount of waste in that sector. You know, probably hundreds of millions of dollars poured into um, ventures that don't don't accomplish the, the change that they're supposed to. And what he realized is what he is doing is often bringing, he, he's, he's at high six, maybe into seven, um, and he's bringing a stratum four plus perspective. And his clients are at three, two, and three, two. And he's now, he's sort of looking around and, and on his behalf, I've been asking friends of mine about this. And this is, the term is, uh, what, what, what the organizations are trying to do is social innovation, right? They're trying to have an impact on society. And I would think, I'm, I'm totally making this up, but I'll, I'll put it out as though I know what I'm talking about, uh, that at two or three, you can have an organization that provides a social service. And we can look at how many meals did we serve, how many kids did we coach. But you go away, and the next year the meals, are, meals aren't there and the kids aren't being coached. If you're going to have a, a lasting impact on society, it's got to be led from four or higher. And so the social innovation that is led from below four needs social innovation accelerators. And that's a, that's a field Jim is, is developing now. And I, I mention it to people who are doing that sort of work, and they knew it, know it instantly. And I bring Strata 4 in and describe what it is, and they know it instantly. So in the not-for-profit world, the Strata 4 also is a, is a key leverage point. And at the risk of making a short story long, um, in, in graduate school, I focused on two things. Piaget and general system theory. And Piaget, the end of his developmental scheme, or what he called formal operations, which sort of goes a, a little bit of it is into stratum one, most of it is below stratum one. The test of this is you give a kid a bunch of pile of, of rods, some two feet long, some three feet long, some one inch in diameter, some two inches in diameter bamboo, wood, copper, and then you say to a kid, tell me, which is more flexible, bamboo or, or wood? Below this stage of formal operations, they'll take one bamboo and one wood and see which bends more. They're into formal operations, they will match the length and the width and then do it, and, and, and then uh, find the flexibility. Separ we call it separation and control of variables which is really what we all learned as the scientific method. So the scientific method is a formalization of what we come to anyway at the end of adolescence. Then I realized maybe, maybe general system theory is the same thing, that you go from independent variables to interdependent variables, from closed boundaries to open boundaries. Um, and, and from, um, uh, from, from independence to interdependence. And, and it turns out that that's what stratum four thinking is. So uh, Ludwig von Bertalanffy, you all, you all know the name, yeah. uh, at the University of Alberta is the one who formalized this into general system theory. And what he, and was what he talked about was, you know, he said, you can, if you, if you do biology the way you do chemistry and physics, you go, ah, let, let's see what the heart does. Well, we would pull their heart out, 
we, we separated from um, uh, the blood supply, the nerve supply, the hormones, because we want to see what the heart is. And he said, well, then you're not studying the heart, you're studying a piece of meat. And because in a system, you can only understand something in its relation to the other parts. That's what stratum-4 capability gives you. So, um, so here are some of the things of, of within a stratum-4 role. Do people have them? Or you know? I have them. Maybe we should just yeah. pass them around. Eh? Yeah. <clears throat> so they can... So one of the um, one of the uh, things, the need then overall in, in this crown core role is the ability to view something as a system whose parts operate independently with each other. One aspect of that um, that I don't see in the RO literature, but it's it's definitely in the systems literature, is negative and feed and positive feedback cycles. Mm -hmm. And this really, it just came out to me, Josh, in your presentation, because when you talked about uh, the viral spread, that's a positive feedback cycle. You put a little drop of energy in there, mm -hmm. and it explodes, because the next person you bring brings three people, each of them brings three people. So that's a positive feedback cycle, a little bit of energy, it brings you a big impact. You can imagine that, you know, that being very useful in a not-for-profit world but also inside of a, a for-profit organization. Negative feedback cycles, which are norm maintainers, right? Homeostatic mechanisms like a thermostat. Well, probably the biggest homeostatic mechanism in an organization, in a work organization is a culture. So it's, it's um, a culture I understand culture to be um, values, beliefs, and norms. And so the norms include, for example, I mean, this is a, it's an old, old example, but when it, whenever you say, well, here's another way of doing it, hey, we could do it this way, and someone says, we've always done it this other way. Okay? So that's a homeostatic mechanism, maintaining the norm of let's keep things the way they have been. And unless you switch, unless you attack that homeostatic mechanism, you're not going to bring about change. Stratum, stratum 4 ability includes the ability to see that and to build the feedback systems you need. You're going to say how, how that sounds. So seeing the situation as a complex system with feedback loops sounds like this sometimes. Finding, a, finding balance is more art than science. And as I was mentioning earlier, there has to be some set of rules that guarantee the ethical, efficient performance of the market. And having said that, we have periods where markets are cyclical, and we have imbalances that occur from time to time, and the role of the regulator is to ensure these cycles are as smooth as possible. And there has to be a balance between how much regulation is required to make sure the markets perform smoothly and at the same time allowing to perform efficiently. This balance is more of an art than a science and it's an ongoing learning process. As markets evolve and players become more sophisticated than the current set of rules, and once the players have mastered the game with the current set of rules, the regulator has to change the rules again so that the spirit of the law is still in place. So it is an iterative process of regularly overseeing the players, players learning how to play the game, and in the long-term equilibrium or balance, so to speak, between the amount of regulation in place and minimize the drawbacks while guaranteeing fair performance of the market. I was struck, I mean, it was probably the second or third sentence in that, having said that, and you hear that awful lot at stratum four and higher, but particularly mm -hmm. stratum four. Someone will make a point or refer to an earlier point. Having said that, you know, here are all the positives. Having said that, here are the negatives. And it's sort of like saying, um, um, well, we've talked about 
this part of the system. Having said that, we have to keep that in mind as we're, we're doing this. Right? Strata 4 requires that, is there that ability to hold multiple things in mind at, at the same time. Um, resolving tension between serial constructs. Um, a uh, friend of mine who used to sell for, uh, for IBM and then learned spiral dynamics and he learned requisite said he knows an IT person uh, is at stratum three by the number of times they use the phrase, oh, that's not my problem. <laughs> I have developed this beautiful serial process that it interferes with his serial process, that's not my problem. It is stratum four's problem, multi dealing with multiple uh, serial, serial processes that, that uh, intersect with each other. So, uh, the, the first quote I, I read about uh, balancing the system was from somebody who is at, at least at mid four and probably at high four, somewhere in there. Very often at the lower end of four, you find people talking about two serial processes. And uh, they can run this one out this way and then they can run this one out that way. And it, a tip-off that they haven't quite made the grade to four is that they can't resolve those conflicts. They can see them, sounds like high three, they can't balance them, they haven't quite got there yet. Here's an example of somebody who's at just in the early stages of four. The United States is, has been the gold standard for higher education. It attracts the best and brightest from across the globe to come here and learn about our country. When you look at the purpose of college experience in college education, it's to be able to develop your ability to think critically, whether it's through learning in the classroom or experiences outside the classroom. The age of typically 18 to 22 are critical years to develop that process, and that is the foundation of free thinking in the world, really. So the problem that I see is that when the University of Chicago was going to have a debate between Austin Goolsby and Stephen Bannon, and you had over 100 professors petition against this debate because they didn't want Steve Bannon on campus. And you, that is the antithesis of what a college campus is intended for, which is so you have the opportunity to engage in discourse with people that hold very different views from you and have your own views challenged, and then evolve your views through that process. You're missing a whole critical aspect of evolving as a human being. So that's framing the problem. I think there's a number of ways you can attack it. If you can help students understand that when you bring a speaker that you don't like to the campus, particularly for a debate opportunity, you're not empowering that speaker. You're being empowered as, as a student to have the opportunity to challenge that person's views. So I think reframing the way it's being perceived by most students on campuses today when a controversial speaker shows up, I think would resonate with younger college students today. Also getting them actively involved in that process early on. So students of different views like college Republicans and college Democrats coming together to plan out what type of speakers to plan out, what type of speakers they could have on campus to engage these deep debates. That way you get buy-in buy from them early on. Now this example shows an ability to take a dynamic in one direction, allowing the speakers weakens us, and reverse its direction, allowing speakers strengthens us, and gives detail on how to execute the reversal, thereby showing stratum four capability. The um, yeah, yeah, but it's low stratum four because he doesn't actually resolve the controversy. Well, it, they have a plan of resol resolution here of getting the. Republicans and Democrats together to plan out the type of speakers. But that's, that's a mechanic for how to decide to have the two sides. That doesn't necessarily resolve the differences between the two sides. Mm -hmm. give you an, it, might, it might not give an opportunity for that resolution to happen. If, 
the process you're talking about is reductionist, it's dialectic. Yeah. Yeah. In, in, di in dialectics, the, it, it's, it's uh, determination, negation, resolution. Right. So you need, but you need the resolution piece to complete the dialectic. The resolution here is between allowing a speaker and not allowing a speaker. You know, allowing a speaker and not wanting to give a speaker uh, a voice, too big a, a bigger megaphone than we want to give. Yeah. Um, the the other thing, you know, as you're as you're talking about, um, uh, there there's an irony. The, <coughs> Jacks referred to this as parallel processing because you see a number of series going along together. Michelle Carter, who's on the team with us, pointed out if they're parallel, then you're high three. Um, the series have to cross for it to be actually at four. And, and I now refer to it as systems processing rather than, than uh, parallel processing. Um, all right. Um, managing multiple mutually supporting paths. So here we were talking about things that com um, uh, compete with each other. At Stratum 4 you also have to have, you may have a number of things that support each other. Do they support them independently or do you actually create synergy? And high 3 will be able to get them, a number of them working together. 4 then will create the synergy. And, and the con conflicts between them. Yeah, yeah. right. Oh, yeah, yeah. I do believe recreation and use of marijuana should be legalized, and I've gotten to this answer by multiple different routes. First of all, historically, why marijuana was legal in the first place has its roots in racist economies of the past. Tobacco farmers tended to be more white, and cannabis farmers tended to be more indigenous and Latino. I'm questioning why it was even outlawed in the first place. Another is that marijuana is one of the safer drugs. Chemically, marijuana is safer than alcohol and tobacco. It causes less immediate health risks and also has less long-term health risks. Also, whereas it's quite easy to overindulge alcohol to a point to be very unhealthy and alcohol poisoning, it's very different than with marijuana where it's very really difficult, if not impossible, to have a chemical overdose of marijuana that could lead to death. So it's safer in that regard. The third thing is we spend a lot of money criminalizing people for what's effectively a non-violent offense. And given that we actually live in a society where our criminal justice system is pretty flawed racially, we also see that non-violent recreational marijuana offenses significantly impact men of color significantly more than white people, even though lots of studies show there's no differences in usage here. We also could tax it, so there's a significant opportunity to get revenue, as we've seen in Colorado. Side comment here, that, but as to the, why we have the law in the first place, the first law forbidding uh, marijuana, I think in Canada, the name of the law was the Chinese Exclusion Act. So this, this is a little, this. Um, all right, next. Uh, looking at things from different points of view. So you will, you will get in a meeting uh, in a stratum four unit, you will get the finance person looking at things from the finance point of view, technology from the technology point of view. Each one is looking at it from their own point of view. Um, one of the hints we get when we're, we're doing our assessments is someone saying, well, from the perspective of, Dot, dot, dot. Now, and that you'll typically get starting at high three. Four is when you can look at things from both the finance and the manufacturing and the, or all three, all the four of them, perspectives at the same time. It depends on where you look at this issue from. If you look at, from, it, look at it from a very high level, there's probably probably businesses, there are some businesses that would struggle with preserving the environment, and there's other businesses that would grow and thrive. But you, if you look at it on a business per business level, and who has influence, and where the stakeholders currently sit, there's a status quo which has inertia, and a lot of the powerful businesses today might not have the same success in an environmentally conservative business environment, and their influence is strong. 
So it's it's uh, just four integrates those perspectives. God has, has to take care of all of them. Um, <clears throat> Again, because each of them is interdependent with each of the others. Inside that serial stratum three uh, perspective, you're just looking at finance or you're just looking at technology. Um, ability to balance. And so here, um, again, from that systems point of view, um, the speed of one thing might affect the speed of another. So you, and you may have a, a whole change you're tr trying to do, which is a change of technology, so that takes time over time. You need training of people to do that, so you don't want to tr get them trained before the technology arrives, but not after either. You want that to arrive simultaneously. And that also may require some hiring that, to start even before all of that. So uh, bringing all of those things into balance, uh, and the, Frequently, uh, very frequently, strata four work has to do with taking budget from this area, moving it into this area, speeding this up, slowing this down. There's often just a, diff a difference in the way people speak. In stratum three, people tend to be quite definite. Stratum four, people tend to talk on the one hand or the other hand. Stratum five, people are definite again. So <laughs> you sometimes just pick it up in the basics. <clears throat> There's a balance to it. If you over-regulate, you basically limit the amount of value created and captured in the economy. And these opportunities will show up somewhere else. Going back to the example I just gave of the bank, if they were very, very limited with their ability to lever themselves, and they're not going to support the growth of the economy, and neither the business goes somewhere else, a different bank in a different country, there is a balance to it. And that then generates a need for sensitivity to time, right? At stratum three, I've got to do this leading to this, leading to this, leading to this. But because at four, you need, you've got to pay more attention to the speed of that, how long that takes, because you've got to balance it with how long something else takes. So sensitivity to time appears at stratum. The acceleration has been fairly rapid. It's been painful because of the cultural issue, which I alluded to earlier. But the truck is moving. This is going to require a lot of organizational rework because there's a lot of structure that goes into how we handle our people development processes. And a lot of that work is underway. But the attitudes are going to take longer to change than the policies. Um. Right next, awareness of what's of, of what's missing, and I'm, I'm uh, I think of this. Uh, there was a Sherlock Holmes story, and and he, he was there was some murder, and um, uh, and Holmes said, "Well, the interesting thing here is is the dog," and the, the police officer said, "Why the dog didn't do anything?" <laughs> yeah, that's why. <laughs> the dog didn't bark. Then, then that tells us something maybe about who, who came in. And I mean, it's funny, I, Bill, we were talking earlier, and uh, you know, from your, I think you, you go back as far in systems theory as I do with this, and, and you pick up that sensitivity that it gives you an awareness of what's missing. Right? Yes. Yes. What you're talking about is often called system blindness. Yeah. And there's five kinds. I'm just going to leave them out. Spatial blindness, mm. you only see your little part of the system. Basically, the, all of this would be below the start of uh, Temporal blindness, you, you don't understand the point. Relationship blindness, you don't see yourself in relationships or interrelationships. Process blindness, where you don't see systems as holes, you just see your little bit of the process. And what's called uncertainty blindness, seeing fixed positions, battling fixed positions, but neither are, are as certain as they should be. Yeah. Well, here, so, here we're talking almost the mirror image of it. That at four, at four, you're not doing anything. Here's the space. Like we don't have a space for this. Right. Right? Everyone's looking around at the space we have. Well, stratum four yeah. is, to me, the first level where somebody actually sees the whole as a system. Yeah. So there's no spatial blindness happening at all. Yeah. And that's what's overcoming a lot of the serial limitations that you're talking about, and makes it a holistic, dialectical approach as opposed to a reductionist serial approach. And that's what I see happening in Stratum 4. Yeah. 
So it's not, it's not innovation through technology, it's innovation and technology. You can probably tell from my resume, resume and from talking to me that I, I like hiring and retaining talents really seriously. It's the only thing I've seen that really moves the needle across the spectrum, regardless of what field you're in. Technology isn't new service lines, right? New service lines can be just as exciting. There are ways to innovate that don't involve technology at all. But I think as the century progresses, we'll find fewer and fewer of these. And when you look at the white space, white space is where things are technically difficult. Where things are technically easy, many times they're already done. So you see innovation and technology so closely married because innovation lives in the white space. I mean, the other thing I'm thinking here is, um, and this could be a, maybe a sixth blindness of, of what's outside the system or what's missing outside the system. And, and we'll pick that up uh, from uh, stratum four candidates that, that, that we interviewed. One of the things that's important here is to understand that if you're below stratum four, you're talking about information systems, you're talking really about the technology. As soon as you get to stratum four, it's not about technology, it's about information, yeah. which is different. It's a different way of talking about what technology is about. You're looking at information flows and utilization as opposed to systems and that kind of stuff. It's a very different language. So because stratum four in an interview is going to be talking about multiple series and their interactions, it takes them a long time to, to get anything said. And at High four, frequently, that fades away. It's a very strange thing when we're interviewing someone at stratum four. It's almost a gut feel of, they're still at four, but I'm not hearing any series. But what you often will hear at high four, and actually for us it's the criterion for high four, is there a hint of stratum five? And the hint of stratum five comes in two ways, at least. One of them is, um, they lay out such a beautiful system that if you are capable at five or above, you see it from the outside and you could name it. The person inside can't do it. Stratum four, I picture some, I sometimes picture stratum three as you're looking through a tube that has joints in it and you can look through one tube at a time, right? And you can see it go from here to here. Four has pipes going from the floor to the ceiling and um, and when you and the person at four is pulling this one down and pulling this one up to match them all in real time and when you say you know and I say how would you solve this problem well I pull this thing down here and at the same time I got to bring this over here and then I'll do this and that brings and then brings that into alignment yet what would you call that well I just told you I pull this down and I pull this over here and they can't answer the question, what, what is it? Because it's not an it to them. At five, you're outside the room looking in. And now you're saying, oh, that's my low cost to market strategy. But at, at four, you're doing that stuff in order to do it. At five, it, the, the coordination itself uh, becomes an entity. Now at high five, so one, one thing at high, at, at high four will be so complete a system that the stratum five or higher assessor is already to put a label on it. But the person at four, at high four, can't do that because they're, they're in, the, in the midst of it. The other thing is they will start using, you know, and now, I mean, I, I remember I was probably in grade three when I first knew the word communist. Uh, I meant a bad person, right? Um, and, and you'll see fourth order language, language that's appropriate for strata five through eight, at lower strata, but you'll hear it a lot more at high four, without their actually being able to use it as an abstract concept. High four to the five, I've had more interviews where I end up at the end saying it's somewhere high four to low five. It's very hard to distinguish that sometimes. But um, uh, you were talking earlier, Josh, about maturation and can that be sped up and so forth. And, and Owen Jacobs certainly thinks that uh, if you're in mode six, you say if you're mode five, so it means by the time you're done, you will have reached strata five. 
throughout your life, but increasingly, particularly at high four, you're building stratum five concepts sort of with a dotted line. You couldn't do any work with them, but you're feeding stuff into it to build it. And so you get all of those hints at high four, you get hints of stratum five. My answer <coughs> is coming from my view of the journalistic state right now. And some of the things I think the three or four criteria I mentioned were who we're reaching, the topics that we're covering, these topics that we are presenting a diverse view. For myself, I try to be an active consumer of media. And in my active consumption, I try not to limit myself to one network or paper. So I do myself to get a diverse array of media providers in my own personal network. With that said, I have my preferences. So if I were to answer the question of how we are doing, how is our journalistic state doing today, I'd say it's suffering and we can do better. And the reason I do that goes back to the, one of the points I mentioned about the 24-7 news cycle. And I think this would be fair that this applies to a broad array of media providers out there that no matter what's your preference or where you fall on the political scale, I think, unfortunately, many, if not all of them, do seem to be driven primarily by getting their viewership numbers up. In so doing, oftentimes, the media is sensationalized. And so when the media is sensationalized and everything is presented as breaking news, the most pressing information that a viewer needs to know, or that is sending alerts on one's phone or as one's computer about the latest story that one needs to hear, and in an, an effort to attract viewership, and then of course when you attract viewership, you're attracting viewers who will watch the ads and then you have the advertisers that are going to see. Where, where's the, um, I'm trying to track it, where's the hint of five in that? Well, um, these, these phrases, the journalistic state right now, mm -hmm. um, an active consumer of media, a diverse array of media providers, a broad array of media providers. The political scale. Political scale, yeah. Okay. The media is sensationalized. Anyway, those yeah, were the yeah, ones that okay. flagged. Yeah. Would it be reasonable, you talked earlier about stratum four being sort of a systems thinking mm -hmm. kind of thing. If you describe stratum five as organizational thinking. You get to a point in stratum four where you, you see it as a system of, a system of systems, where stratum five you look at, no, no, that's an organization. So instead of just a room full of pipes, which is a system of systems, you actually see the room. I, I so Elliot called the four processes declarative, cumulative, serial, parallel. And for me, it's the first one I, I refer to as unitary. Declarative doesn't really describe it, but at unitary processing, you are using at stratum five one fourth order concept right. at a time. Right. But I'm saying, but when you get to high stratum four, you're starting to talk about systems and systems, but you don't actually see it as a, an organization label. It, 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 it doesn't work for me. It but, work for yeah. I was wondering if that's yeah. the right way to talk about it, because yeah. it seems to me that you're talking about. Um, it's not so much like when you talk about being able to see not just the systems, but see from the outside what yes. it really is mm -hmm. as a whole and label it. Yeah. That's something that's hard to do in the inside and system four, or stratum four thinking is still inside. Is it still inside? Stratum five is where you're outside. And so, so when you get to the high stratum four, you're starting to see hints of being able yeah. to step outside and look down yeah. at what they're doing. Yeah. Is that kind of what you're looking for? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and the... Um, I mean, the first transition where this occurs, and this is very big for me, I've got an almost 15-month-old grandson who I spent the weekend with, and uh, so he's first order, what, what uh, Piaget called sensory motor stage. No, no, all he has, he deals with is his own movement and his sensation. And, but we look at him and we say, oh, look, he's grabbing the cup. He's moving the cup. No, he's not. He's moving his arm, and he has a visual feel of something <laughs> moving. Um, but in another four months, six months, whatever, he'll have a cup. And what he's doing is all of these move. You know, so you've got the you've got the bottle, 
So he looks at the bottle, he drinks from the bottle, he throws the bottle, and when he's doing that, all kinds of visual images change. Uh, there's, there's sound, there's his own movement, and he his ability to coordinate all of that means he can do systems processing at first order. He's moving his sensations and his body all like that. At one point, he's going to abstract, pull out from that system, bottle. You know, and the reason why we don't have language until second order is we don't have anything to talk about. There's no thing to talk about. So it's the same thing. Uh, and, and then the blue is a manifest, the blue sensation is a manifestation of the blue thing. Right? And it's, it's where a, um, uh, an economist who's capable at five or higher, and has actually studied economics, will, will, or, or politics, <laughs> would say, uh, this is a manifest, the, our current, you know, we, at, at third order, strata one through four, we can say we're having a recession. Above there, they'd say, well, it's a manifestation of a, our form of capitalism right now. So each order is understood as a manifestation of the next higher when you get to that. And that's what, so at five, now, all of these things that are happening inside of that system are a manifestation of, well, it's, it's my low, low cost to market strategy. You have a, you don't have a thing there, or do you? No, I don't think I have a thing. I think you did all. <laughs> Are we doing anything for business unit executive at five? Well, yeah, we okay. are. All right, so that that's what I'm, ah, that's what I meant for five. Yeah, yeah that's okay. right. Well, well, we don't, you that's did. it. I did it. Okay, okay. All, right. all right. So, all right. Yeah. so here, yeah. so if you're, if you're, you've got somebody at high four that you're wanting to know whether they're actually still there at four, then you want to, then you want to listen for some, um, Clarity around these labels, the clarity around the ability to, to, to take the pieces and say that, that's my low cost to market strategy or that's the organization or that's the, and uh, so let me give you this one here. Now as we think about capitalism and we think about democracy, democracy is hard sometimes, one person, one vote. So we have people who study the issues. They're smart, they're prepared, they go to the ballot box and they vote in a very informed vote. And that one person's very informed, very thoughtful vote gets canceled out by someone who doesn't know anything, who's just voting for the candidate that has the most charismatic looking features. And that's something about democracy that really bothers me. But at the same time, now that's stratum four, yeah like attention to dynamics and intention, but at the same time. I am speaking from a place of, how can I articulate this? Now that's stratum five like fussing with words. How can I, how, how can I label this? I wonder sometimes if the people who are ostensibly more intelligent or the people who are ostensibly more prepared or more informed about the issues are those people who also in a position to maybe exploit the climate, to exploit their environment, to exploit the world, to exploit the government. So I think that the person who may be less prepared or less intelligent or less informed, having an equal vote sometimes cancels out. Now that's the stratum for resolution of tensions. The ability of other people to maybe exploit to exploit the system. So it's hard for me to think about an equal weighted democracy. Now there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a stratum five label. It's Trump the naming of a model, equal weighted democracy. So so Trump shows up everywhere. Pardon? <coughs> Trump shows up everywhere. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> because of those attention <laughs> A believably weighted type of system, so then it's a, a fussing with naming the model, and that makes sense. But how how do you how do you implement that in a government? Who's going to be the arbiter of oh this person gets 1.4 votes, and this person gets 0.8 votes because they know more. well again it's arbitrary. The person who may not know as much about politics or about regulatory issues or about government may know a ton about plumbing 
and the issues that affect municipal governments and environmental issues, things that they don't get to vote on, things that aren't a part of the electoral process. Let me return to the main track here. Democracy, one person, one vote, seems to make sense in large enough populations where you're able to get signal and noise that kind of cancels itself out. Again, a stratum for a resolution of tensions. With capitalism, the first thing that comes to mind for me with capitalism is meritocracy. Now that's naming a fourth order model. It is about effort, it's about evolution, and those are the things that come to me. So I want to go back. I just got this other example um, from Strata 4. I was thinking of, of um, um, it was a, a novel, Hawaii. Um, Dictionary. 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 50, 60 years ago, whatever. And there was an, uh, an incident when the pineapple industry in Hawaii was collapsing. Plants were dying. And they're looking for a virus and they're looking for. Um, insects and what is it that could be attacking it and one person did a chemical analysis of the pineapple plant and a chemical analysis of the soil and found out the mineral that was missing in the plants so the plants had over the years sucked all of the mm -hmm. cadmium or whatever it was out of the soil but it like Stratum 3 would look at what's attacking it. Mm -hmm. Stratum 4 would say, well, what's missing? What's, what's mm -hmm. not here? So just let me uh, <coughs> bring Oh, this. sorry. sorry. <laughs> and because and, the other thing is kind of... Who's bringing it? Right. <laughs> um, <coughs> some of you may know Anne Stephen. Um, she worked a uh, did a lot of work at Bank of Montreal. She's now VPHR at Torex Gold, which is by far the most requisite company I've ever had any dealings with. And she kept saying, you know, the problem around here when she was at the bank is they're always giving us more stuff to do. Here are these forms you need to, here are these meetings. And they never talked about what to take away. And you know, and there are people at the bank who are you know capable at four and higher, but they don't do that. And and as trainers, it took. I'm embarrassed how long it took me to realize I'm giving people information about requisite organization without pulling out the belief system they have. You know that that when I say um, a manager is an employee who's accountable for the output and working behaviors of others. They hear a manager is a son of a bitch, micromanaging, uh, power hungry, who, who who is accountable for the uh, working behavior and output of others. That that um, and now I mean now to go to 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 five, it's like you've got to be aware of the paradigm they're working within, um, because a paradigm would typically be a stratum five kind of concept. And that you've got to address the paradigm they're in before you can bring in a new, a new paradigm. And that's something trainers are not trained to do. Uh, actually, Elliot never taught, taught us about that. It, the, uh, it was as though you can simply come in on a Friday afternoon and say, okay, from now on, this is what the word manager means, and, uh, and here's what your roles are. Uh, Monday, we'll start, we'll start out. So for, again, you've got you to be aware of what you have to pull out. No, you're done? Yes. I'd just like to know what it looks like to pull that out as a trainer. Um, so, uh, did a, a three-day training with the client and before we did any of the training and requisite, right? right. Um, as a work group, if you're the, the manager of, of this group, you would lead a discussion. I would ask you to lead a discussion. Uh, fill up one sheet of flip, flip chart paper with what is it that gets in the way of you doing the work you need to do. Okay. Um, listening in for what are the belief systems there. And at this client, it was uh, the belief system was we will get productive the nicer we are to each other. And so accountability doesn't sound very nice. And we did a bunch of stuff, and then uh, what, what, what he had three tables each with a stratum, one stratum three manager and their stratum two subordinates. And we were talking about lateral relationships. 
and I and I said, um, um, you know, and, and Peter in one group said, uh, look, um, we, um, I get what you're trying to do here, and it's all very nice, but but there there are times we just need to pull Josh out from table two, and um, and you're you know you're asking us to go through all this complex stuff. And you know, sometimes, just sometimes, the gods smile nicely on you. And, and I went over to table three and I said, what happens to you when they pull Josh out? And they said, we're thrown into chaos. Mm -hmm. No, so these are all three and two. They're not, they're not systems people. So basically you're mirroring. I'm mirroring, I, what I'm trying to do, because uh, the thing about a, 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 to collapse a paradigm, you have to, help them know in their bones that their current way of thinking about things not only doesn't but cannot solve their problem. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So I'm demonstrating here's a case where being nicer. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. That's very gestalt. <laughs> yeah, oh yeah. Well gestalt, yeah. All the parts are they're a whole. Thank you. Know, so we so we're talking about stratum four and Bill was saying earlier that they're sort of scarce as hen's teeth, mm -hmm. particularly in the IT world. And listen to Josh talking about these engineer uh, rich com companies with lots of young people with, uh, with the capabilities, but they, they, he's seeing the need to, to, uh, to take this up with growth um, curve and that they're going to need more stratum forests. Well, is this, is this something that it, it just isn't going to happen? because there aren't enough of them? Well, I, I suggest that it maybe is no longer so. And Josh was mentioning it this morning when he talked about the talent upshift. Now, um, during the 20th century, there was a, something like a 30% a increase in measure, measured IQ in the, in the Western world. And this is known as the Flynn effect. Now, if Elliot were here, he would say, well, that's IQ, and I'm talking about something else. But my thesis would be that 50 years ago, when Elliot was dealing with this world and putting together his pieces, he was identifying that the stratum four and up were something less than 3% of the population. 2%, 2%, 2 of the population. So it's almost insignificant in what's available. But if you, but if you apply the same upshift, to Eliot's curves, to, to Eliot's strata that uh, the Flynn found in the in the IQ strata, we've gone from having less than three percent of stratum four to maybe having seven percent of stratum four, which suggests there may be a lot of young people out there who don't have the skill, knowledge, and experience, but do have the horsepower to power the curve Josh is talking about. You you um. You know, if you've seen anything in requisite, you, you know, you've seen that family of nested curves that, that shows if you're at stratum three at this age, here's what you were when you were 20, and here's what you'll be when you're 90. Um, and when I, when I met Elliot, I was coming fresh from the um, uh, let's empower everyone uh, movement. Uh, and I, I, when I met him, I said, you know, you don't really believe those curves, do you? He said, well, well why not? Well, it's not very egalitarian. <laughs> and a question I came to expect, he said, well, define your terms. What, what do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. And uh, I said, I guess it's that with enough effort and opportunity, anyone can accomplish anything. He said, oh, interesting. So with, a, with enough effort and opportunity, anyone can do what, Mike, what Einstein did, what Mozart did. And it was, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm going to do a blog on this. There have been 10 or 20 times in my life where someone's asked a question or I've asked a question. I came into it and I came out of a different person. Mm -hmm. uh, because I knew instantly that when I was 26, I had not done anything like develop a theory of relativity. And I kind of suspected it wasn't just because of lack of effort or opportunity. <laughs> um, uh, so I went in as a as total blank slate came out total determinist. And then I'm hearing stuff like this, and, and uh, IQ would relate to mode rather than to, to current stratum. 
Uh, and going back, I've mentioned Owen Jacobs before. He um, he thinks that put it that that you can affect the rate of someone's maturation. And I'll, I'll, when I remember talking about this with Elliot, he said, well, you know, because he, he was trained as a physician, he said, you bring a baby in at two months and the doctor can pretty well know how tall the baby will end up. So this is exactly the same thing. And I think I thought of it at the time, but I didn't mention it. This is on the list of 87 questions I would wish Elliot were still around to, to put to him. Um, what about nutrition? You know, because people uh, move from different countries to North America and suddenly they're a lot taller than they used to be. And uh, Owen, part of Owen's thesis is that we live in a much more complex world than 50 years ago. One of his, his pieces of evidence, he says he likes to watch movies. He can't watch anything made before, I think it was 1970, which is too boring. Um, those of you who remember the sting when it when it came out, a plot within a plot. You, you can't have a half hour TV show now that doesn't have a plot within a plot within a plot. Someone was dreaming it at the end. And, and so we live in a much more complex world. And so I think of those curves, if they were accurate, they would be a little higher than they are. And um, it's referred to as potential capability. I would call the potential potential capability. This is what your capability for information processing, the highest your genetics allow it to be. Your experience will determine how close to that you get. Just like I think genetically we've got a height limit for each of us and then nutrition and whatever else would bring us closer to it. And and because I don't think I don't think of genetics as moving that quickly in fifty years. But, but it, it certainly makes sense to me that we have a potential higher than what we're at. You know, what we have that potential potential depends on how much we exercise. So he, he says if you're at four and you've got a high three subordinate, what you want to do, first of all, is give them a lot of work that really is three work. So they are building up a vocabulary of series that when they move into four, they can wend them together. And then give them stretch safe to fail assignments to say, all right, here's, here's this project, design it, but don't run with the design, come to me first. <laughs> and now the manager at four is saying, well, do you see how this series is going to interfere with this one? Yeah. Or at high three, the person might say, here it is, but I know these two don't work together. Help me figure out how to do it. So now you have a vocabulary even of strata four templates when you're only three capable, high three capable. So that's going to pull someone into their four capability earlier than they would have otherwise. My belief is you've got to have the genetics that will allow you to do that at that point. But there is some room for that. That's sort of my in between between the, the, the blank slate and, and the, the genetics is everything. One, well, I would, let's. My take as well is the yeah. same thing. There's, you have a genetic ceiling, but the, the, there's factors that affect your development that are complicated enough that it looks like it's not going to happen in terms of. Um, so, for for example, here. I, I mean, sorry, but you I mean, you mentioned something yes. like when you were up front that sounded exactly like that to yeah, me. Yeah, that's, yeah, that was what was happening with me. But yeah. but also part of um, when you look at it on more of a the generational difference is um, the one of the enablers there is that the world around them, they weren't dealing with complexity in the same way um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Where now, somebody my age, they hear about all the political stuff because somebody makes a video about it that's accessible at their level. And then they have all the information to go look at that. Then they go do their fun free time stuff, which is Game of Thrones, which is like a, <laughs> a, or something like that. And, yeah. but, but the issue is that they, they've got more um, reps and, and um, being modeled to them what to do. Now it's still not at the point where, because I still think there's even more room for that sort of coaching or, or development, particularly with people who don't end up in a position where their managers are one level above them, or that they're aware of it. I think even the awareness itself is a, an aspect of it, because it's not just saying this is going to conflict with this, it's saying 
what you should expect to happen over the next four or five years is is think about how this is going to relate to that. Mm -hmm. And it's like that alone is what made a difference for me. It was the awareness of seeing how I was processing the information, seeing what the next step would be. That didn't mean I could do it right away, but it meant that as opposed to getting deeper in my serials, I started looking at how the hell I was going to reconcile two different competing ones. And so, anyway, I'm, I, I wholeheartedly agree <laughs> with, with what you're saying. Would it be uh, to uh, the seal to say that you strengthen a person who's in transition or help them to be aware, yeah. and then that strengthening leads to a quicker, stronger uh, shift <coughs> through the transition? I mean, would that. It's, uh, is that it's what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Not awareness is part of it, but also using that muscle more. The feedback loop thing. Well, that that you're you're my manager. You're giving. You're you're making me do the highest work yes. I can do. Yes. The usefulness of this I, is it leading to an article book for managers at five. To staff at four, is that what it's leading? That's what it's leading to in my mind. I just wanted to name it. Yeah. So. Yeah. Uh, I, I, he I he might be at five. Yeah, I, no, I'm just, I've learned how, to fool, I've learned how to fool the system. Uh, I just want to, in the literature, I'm not up to date, but Cotter, I believe it was Cotter at Harvard, wrote a book called The General Manager. Yes. Which I used to have on my head, but there was a lot of descriptive material. There are others, uh, the work levels approach by Billis and Robotum, where they're describing for work. And you've got your description from your coding experience. Now, I'm just wondering if you were to present such a book or write it, it might help if you could put it in the context of the existing literature on. General management theory, like Cotter and Harvard, these are some respected people. A lot of people are looking at that. Yeah. Or at the work that um, <coughs> was done by the uh, by the fellow, no, the fellow at GE. Uh, I, I've got his books and his name is not hitting me. The leadership pipeline is based on the mm -hmm. yeah. work. What's it? It's uh, Drotter, Steve Drotter. Yeah, Steve Drotter. Um, he has the leadership pipeline. He's got descriptive material that's supposedly based on Jackson. GE has. So I'm just thinking some references, some knowledge, if you could ground and validate or show differences, that would show something. But I think if, if, you, if many in our field neglect the rest of the literature and just assert what we're doing, but I think it might strengthen if you had some perspective on that. And, uh, and there may be some great validation if you can tie it in, because I imagine Drotter's book, excuse me, uh, uh, The Leadership Pipeline, is probably the best, or the most sold book on talent management in the world. That's what I heard from. So if you relate to that, that could help, because people know that. Or Cotter's work on general managers, my hunch is that's probably one of the best known books on the general manager. So anyway, not to, but and that's the, the system that I would play with. I, I loved your discussion. And um, uh, you know, I, 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 thought it, I'm, I, I think people have written at different levels about this system. I have not, for instance, a lot of the stuff I've heard from Owen Jacobs, they were working to get captains up one more level. Now, all the acceleration was six months of systems thinking. <coughs> I get one third of the level with night and day work for six months. Mm -hmm. uh, at that step, and you wrote about that. Uh, I don't know anyone who's talked about this fourness. Mm -hmm. Do you, does anyone know anything in the, in the IRO literature where anybody has talked about the explicit <coughs> fourness? I think you yeah. got it. I'm, I'm hearing, again, I mean, I, and I remember this from Anne 10, 15 years ago, saying four is the pivot point. Mm -hmm. And I hadn't heard it before that, but I've heard it from her over the years. And definitely uh, Jim Bauer about social innovation acceleration. And I've heard it from Owen Jacobs. Yeah. Four yeah. is really Well, he, he has a very different model from yes. Jax's, and he considers 
one through three to be one order of information and four and five to be another. So, so for him, that's that's more abstract. And you were trying to get him. Thank you, Bonnie. You're already here. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that uh, strikes me about uh, <coughs> the dynamics of stress I think need to be taken into account. And this is a particularly important uh, job for what you are. Your people are always just about to drown. Right. Uh, as a group, I mean, that's the rate of change they're dealing with. But also, if you get uh, a lot of stress, uh, you will learn more quickly. I don't mean, you know, sleep galley kind of thing, but the right amount of stress. And that always goes back to, uh, what's his name, uh, in the flow. Uh, well, so that is uh, a point which, if there's any acceleration, you get people going and know what you're doing. This is the key thing. I mean, describe it. Give them that. Make them there. That's what you're challenging. Not so much you know they're going to fail. That, that's asking for it. Uh, but and one of the things that I find looking at a lot of literature that somehow, uh, maybe it's the written form, the dynamics don't come out. And it's the dynamics, I think, that are really important in all of this as well. So you've got to convey, don't ask me how to do it yeah. in the print. <laughs> no, that's, some, that's your challenge. <laughs> uh, uh, but it's got to come out, maybe uh, uh, what Ford does with the gamification model. You can get the dynamics in that. You have your idea. You set it up as a gamification, so it's not only a book can, but it's a book and. And see, then people will pick it up. And you used the expression, uh, it was, uh, uh, wasn't it uh, feel your stomach was equivalent to that a few minutes ago? You've got to feel it somehow. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so you stress them, they're feeling it, but they can do it. And particularly with coaching, because that's what you want to find mm -hmm. out. You've got to put it all together. And then I think there's a, a running shot at uh, getting a few companies that will scale, Josh, because that's some, what the issue is at scale. So, yeah, to add to what uh, Ken was saying, if you can do that, uh, it would be an impressive feat, and it hasn't <laughs> been done before. <laughs> so, of course, I'll ask you. <laughs> It would be put it as a what's the question when you say you'd ask? Or we, I'm not sure if you were joking or if you well, were I was just joking, so yeah. I asked him to do it. Okay. Uh, it, <coughs> say what it is? Oh. Uh, basically to uh, provide a an integrated uh, I'm gonna call it a, a learning package, which you have your text. So the book that can describe it. But it's backed up by uh, essentially simulation devices geared to the text, the text is the spine. And as you uh, tell people to do this, you know, read, read this, but try this. So you pull them in. And the reason I'm saying this is a friend of mine at Rock who teaches leadership, uh, Barry Wright. Mm -hmm. And he's got this instructor's manual for his course. And I started to read this thing, it made me mad. What am I going to say? He's a good guy. <laughs> and we were. But the parts were all stuck together. And there was no way that uh, his students <coughs> could say, this is what it means to me. So I'm going to have a big argument with you. So I'm going to tell you, look, write this thing from the point of view of the job and the team. And then you can build on all the dynamics that I'm thinking about. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's what we're trying to do here, yeah. is to say, here's what Strata for work is. Yeah. Here's what it sounds like. Yeah, but yeah. you can do two things. I mean, uh, you can probably help us out. Uh, but uh, if you set up this uh, uh, simulation approach to complement this, then you can actually train people to see and hear this way. Mm -hmm. like you said, Josh, and that's a way of bringing mm -hmm. it in. Say, so, okay, there's the target. Uh, it's sort of the city on the hill. I can see the hill, I can see the city. But I ain't there yet, and you know it. And if you're pushed, you push hard, 
you'll get there a little faster than the stress level, as long as it isn't over time. Well, and you can also look at it as like, it's knowledge transfer, it's not writing a book. Yeah. And so if you're doing knowledge transfer, if you're just doing a book, it's static. And it's, you can take away what you can take away, but if you can add a dynamic element, like a, a living epilogue, as well as maybe some videos, or, or, or some form of more interactive, and so you're talking about simulation, but it, you could also even be more of a conversation using YouTube and the features of interacting at a global scale in terms of I'll give another talk on the book and then let's go through some examples as people ask questions you have that but it's a, you, you build sort of that whole architecture because the idea is not just okay here's the information you have to get that to a level of what does it mean to me is yeah exactly yeah. Well, on that point Josh Herb you gave quite an articulate description of, of coaching a three to learn mm -hmm. the pieces of four. Mm -hmm. Do you have a similar line of thought on the coaching four to understand how to get to five? Hey, sure, it would, be, it would be the same thing. Um, uh, um, oh, now that's, oh, is it? That's interesting. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could, one to two and two to three I could do easily. Four to five would be um, difficult. Because it's an order yeah. shift. Yeah. Yeah, it's an order step, and and I'm looking for what what would you ask them to do? Um, uh, come up with a system to put a name on it. Uh, it doesn't. Well, yeah, right. Yeah. I think there's a solution in terms of what would you do. Uh, I would uh, say that the, the business model, which can easily be represented in the business model canvas, which has all these points. You can use that as a discussion point because it's the interaction between all of these elements that's really critical for them. And so if you have that as your centerpiece, then you can uh, get your conversations, you can do your videos and anything else. And uh, I would think that would be very valuable. I, I mean, I'm thinking, at, and I'm going back, so, so you've got someone at high four. Yeah. They can build these, these models. So I would say to them, I'd start saying to them, what would you call that? I would actually ask them to label them, have a discussion, and then say, does that label get to the essence of it? We'd have that kind of conversation. And, and is there some training about then the transferability of that yeah, model? Yeah, yeah, right. And then, and now and can we you drill yeah, it down can, over there? Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Apply to a different. Now, here's the thing that I have this way of coordinating my manufacturing plan. I four and I've got all of that stuff going, um, and I suppose you could put me in a different factory or something where the output is, you know, it's not even a manufacturing point, but there's some output. Um, I'm still taking my ability to work with interdependence here, and I'm still working with there. I suppose the thing would be, yeah. So, so can you take that system? Yeah, not just doing it in real time, but as much as you can. Yeah, take that system and find out right. here. Yeah. Well, I think her, what we we're saying is, not only you read, there are these transitions uh, uh, in the pattern of thought. And that's the key, because they are in themselves stressful. Yeah, yes. And uh, the it, acknowledgement, this is one of the things that Jogger does quite well. He talks about the changes and the transitions, and the change in what you do and what you enable others to do, which I've always found mm -hmm. quite helpful. And uh, my, and this is just a hunch, so you better go test it, Josh. Uh, if you took the business model and said, look, this is a transition, and you have to be very comfortable, the business model is a different kind of system than a functional system with a general manager, which I believe to be true. If you think of it as a business operating model as opposed to a business system, and you, if you think of it as an operating model which is the system of systems, that yeah. requires a different way of thinking about what you're looking at. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. yeah. You got it. Thanks. I mean, I could even see someone at high four coaching someone at low four, right, and with the, the five 
coaching the forward and high forward about how to do that. Interesting. Right? And then and then looking applying their five capability to it. You know? And the the high four now seeing that as one model I can use. No no when Owen talks with the army about the generals in there. Mm -hmm conceptual models. Is that the same thing? Oh, totally, totally. Mental, mental models is, is his thing, and he's always talking about, you know, if you're in mode five, um, you know, by the time you're 30, at least you're building your fourth order concepts and, dot, and as a mental model with a dotted line around it. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the mode distinction is drawing the line on the mode? Under well, the yeah, because if you were mode three, you would not be building shadow uh, fourth order concepts. Yeah. Yeah. Ken likes the practical stuff. The numbers you get, I think uh, you can say that they're building the fourth star. <laughs> <laughs> but it's about right, isn't it? Wait. Well, I mean, somebody at age 30, yeah. who is capable of five. Oh, oh, I think if at 30 they're capable of five. Yeah, then, which is very rare. But then, then they're... Uh, they could be a fourth up to seven. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. They would probably be both seven. Yeah. Four star. Would that be two? So is there is there anything else or we kind of run out of our our Zork this afternoon? Well, you know what, uh, I find kind of um, intriguing. There, there have been statistics about um, the number of businesses that are, you know, like startup or, uh, you know, they're really just, and at the middle, a number of middle, you know, men, or middle, what's the right word, mid-sized business and large businesses. And so it intrigues me then to think about um, how this might apply to these different types of businesses, what percentage of, um, of these levels do these businesses have? I haven't quite put this together. Um, but, you know, there must be some way to correlate, like for um, st like startup businesses, you know, maybe they only require level one or two people to get them started, probably t two or three. But as businesses grow, they're going to need increasing level of complexity with management. Um, so it would be interesting to, if there was a way to assess, you know, what's the statistics around um, the general level of capability within these organizations. And do, do you kind of get what I'm thinking about? Yeah, I don't. Can, yeah. Can you? Well, uh, it's. I've heard Josh talk about this that the that the, the startups uh, get going with their product at, at th a leader at three, yeah. and then uh, their exit strategy usually is somebody yeah. buys it and makes takes it into another business and away they go as a component of something else because they can't go beyond three. And so Josh is dealing with them that are at the next stage where the leader is at four and he's got the ability to put the, all the pieces together in a way, at least in the cases he's talking about, that have the potential to scale. Now these guys can only scale if they're able to step to five. I think this is probably true. And, I and pull four in. I hear them reaching for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Is, is this what happened to BlackBerry? Uh, Does BlackBerry have the capability to produce the machine, but not to build a business around it? Uh, I think it was more the fact that uh, anything that happened, there were silos, and there was nobody above Lazarinus and Vasily to uh, aid. When it, when it fell apart, because we were went very well for a number of years. Yeah, mm -hmm. When it fell apart, there was nobody who could pull it back in that system. Nobody. Including uh, the guys who got them there. And from what I can see of Lazarus now, 
he seems to be doing things that were are, uh, sort of Bill Gates-like. I mean, he set up the quantum institute here, he's got a quantum VC firm, all this kind of thing. So he's thinking pretty broadly about what he's doing on the physics side mm -hmm. and uh, what it's going to take to make it be realized in the world. Uh, how accurate is the thing? But uh, I think the fault there. Uh, this is something that, uh, speaking with some of you, sometimes invest these things. What happened with BlackBerry was Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. and Steve Jobs and his organization were functioning at least one level above BlackBerry and its organization, I mean, probably two, because Lazaridis <coughs> understood technically what they had achieved. Mm -hmm put a Mac in the phone, mm -hmm. and, but didn't seem to grasp that the real threat was this was so powerful, it would cause the networks mm -hmm. to violate everything a network designer to that day had held dear, like the system stability. And in fact, the phone was mm -hmm. crashing the networks. And they just decided to go. So I think it was a one level, easy, two maybe. Yeah. I think that's what happened. Okay. And, uh, my advice to you, if you run into a situation where you think that the competitive firm is one level above you, sell out early and get a good price. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure. That, uh, I mean, you can see. Uh, Piece of software you to look at this. What you see is how the people think about the critical factors that have been identified for business success. Uh, and the, the ones and twos, you know, if they get the product out the door, they're doing well. And that's no trivial challenge either. However, once in a while you find somebody who understands that he's going to do A, B, C, D, and E. The factors. And that's a pretty good predictor uh, that the person is usually a guy, but not necessarily, uh, can do it. Whether they can build the organization underneath them, uh, which is boring, uh, totally different question. And they never get told that. So I think that. Uh, when I'm talking with my angel investor friends, I'm basically telling them two things. If the person can't give you a convincing uh, demonstration that they understand how to manipulate the components in the business model, and that means they can balance them, uh, you ought to consider uh, very carefully when you want to invest, because you're going to have to replace them. Because it sounds like you're saying a minimum strata four. Well, basically, if they're balancing the components of the business model against the outside, I assume it's a five. Mm. Because they're having to do it under, without much experience often. Okay. And they have to do it, uh, and you're right about it. If they've got the system says they can do it. And they're not going to get much good guidance. So I assume that if it isn't a f the person isn't five capable, when they are the CEO, you're in for trouble. Here. Yeah, I, I would agree that the, the difference between the founder and the executive role is five. And you can be, but like, if the same person's going to make that transition, they have to at least be a five. And then even if you just look from a time span perspective, you're probably not building the whole organization in under five years. It's going to take you that long to build everything mm -hmm. to the point where it's maybe like you've started to refine things. So uh, I think it checks out at five. And, and four would in, increase the business by 15% each year yeah. rather than build towards a five-year doubling or whatever it is. Yeah. So, uh, we're talking more than doubling, we're talking going by five times or something. Yeah. 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 So yeah, unless, unless you're at least low five, I guess, you're, yeah. you're going to chip away at it, which won't get it. Yeah. 
So another, in building the article, I'm just thinking of the network and where you might go. I know that Enhancer has this tremendous database and they spend a lot of time working with investors as in assessing whether people can actually take the firm up. And I think you could test some of your writing and things with them and get some insights about what it takes because they've checked these firms and they have cases on what's happened when investors have gone ahead with a person or replaced them and so forth. But that may be your most coherent database. Mm -hmm. Sorry, which and one? And the other, Hans and Hanser in Sweden. Ulf, okay, Ulf oh yes, yes. Ulf Lindberg, yeah. Yeah. And the other um, database, uh, which you're both familiar with, is uh, smaller, Julian Fairfield, when he, his article is on upshifting, and it's this thing, if you see somebody's operating higher than you are, he would go in and do a competitive advantage, when he met with the CEO, he would do a competitive advantage of the um, field and see at what level these functions were operating and then help this firm choose a function where they could outperform, use their strengths and invest in that. So it was a very strategic uplifting and working on that particular function. So that brings me, if, if you go at it from a strategy point of view, and I'm, I'm trying to use the language, from the perspective of strategy, if you're, if you're, going, if you're going to use that, and we could use many, uh, Actually, an example, I'm thinking of a case example at the end of your book, where a firm wanted to compete using Julian's model and wanted to raise their IT function, because that's an important one to raise, because of the digital innovation, and how they interviewed different people. I mean, you could make up the interviews and show these different, and how your method would help them choose the right person to actually upgrade that, that function. But that's tying it to strategy mm -hmm. and competitive strategy, which I think would make the article saleable. Mm -hmm. I mean, I read, I mean yeah, yeah. Uh, increase readership. Mm -hmm. Are we done? I think we're done. It was fun. Yeah. Yeah,